All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. And um, Amanda ran up to get a few more copies for me, so if someone doesn't have the, the paper, um, don't, don't worry, the world won't end without it, but she, she's getting a few more. And then um, Pastor Conrad, our circuit visitor, is here today. So if he comes down, um, we might just pause whatever we're doing at that point and give him a chance to I probably will want to share a greeting from the circuit, and then this, that's a good chance for us to ask if we have any questions now about what's going on in the circuit or the district or the synod, or um, he'd, he'd be a good person to, to probably uh, ask about that. I'm sure he'd be glad to get any questions you might have. So we'll just pause when, when he comes. So let's uh, open with a word of prayer. Almighty God, bless my brothers and sisters, those in whose hearts you have place the impulse to want to hear more of your word, to look upon it, to read it, to feel the text in their, in their fingers as they hold the sacred script. And I pray, O oh Lord, that it will be life to them, that it will strengthen and build them up, that everything in their lives, O oh Lord, will be seen through this prism of your holy word and that it will be a great joy. Lord, bless our study now together, our time Help us to understand your word, to grasp it rightly, and move it to build faith in our hearts, trust and confidence in it, and in Christ our Savior, the one in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, very glad that you're here. I like to see a, a full Bible study class. That makes me very happy. I'm encouraged by that. When, when the circuit pastor comes, can you give him your seat? Otherwise, I won't be able to. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just give up the seat. <laughs> okay. All right, so what we're doing right now is just looking at the foundational texts on the institution of the Lord's Supper. We only got through two of them last, last week, Matthew and Luke. So today we're going to take a look at um, Mark and 1 Corinthians. So I invite you in your Bibles to open up to um, Mark 14. Mark 14. And I'll, I'll read it starting at verse 12. What I want you to do as we're, as we're reading it, as you're hearing it, and as you're looking at it, look for things that stand out to you. What, what strikes you as we're going through it? What are parts, especially if you were here last week, what are things you noticed that are similar to what we saw in the, the Matthew and Luke accounts? What might be, what might be any different? Uh, what, what, th this is just our chance to start molding the clay here a little bit. We're just working it slowly. So, so what, what grabs you as we, as we see it? And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where will you have us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. There prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve, and as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and to say to him one after another, Is it I? He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. And as they were eating, he took bread. And after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new 
in the kingdom of God. Okay, what uh, what stood out for you as you were looking at that scripture? So they, they were. It sounds like they were already eating, and then the the special things came taking the bread, yeah. breaking it. So it wasn't like in Corinthians where say this isn't even you're not even doing the Lord's so, supper, uh -huh. right? So that that stuck out, and they all drank of it. Yes. So it's 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 part of the Passover meal. So when we have the Lord's Supper here, we're not eating a full meal. We just you just get the little. If you're if you're hungry when you come to church, stay out by the cookies because that little <laughs> wafer that's not going to do it for you. Um, but there there this institution of the Lord's Supper is in the context of the Passover meal. Yeah, good observation. Good. What else? Well, he does state that this is my body and this is my blood. Yeah. All three of the Gospels yes. have said that, haven't mm -hmm. they? They're, it's very interesting. It speaks to the, the emphasis upon it, right? When, when all three of them are, are mentioning it, mm -hmm. to me that indicates that it's pretty important. Especially it worded precisely. Yes. Good. Um, this isn't as important, but the view that I have of the Last Supper of them all sitting at a table, they were all reclining. They probably were all in a room kind of laying around. It wasn't probably at a table. Yeah. I don't know if you could hear her in the back. She's talking about the, the picture, the view of what this looks like. And we're used to Da Vinci's painting of the Lord's Supper, right? They're all at a table like this, seated from one end to the other. Um, but if we get to do that triclinium next year, you'll, you'll get a better sense of what this probably was more similar to um, based on the, the culture and the way that they did it. Well, let's, I'm going to take a pause here for just a, a minute. And we have special guests. Um, Pastor Joshua Conrad is our circuit visitor. He's a pastor up at St. Peter's in Waterford, and his wife, Stephanie, is with us today. And just introduce all the beautiful children, just the beautiful ones. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. No! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, buddy. 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 I came incognito today, um, so I wore a tie. Every every Sunday, he's like, Daddy, can you wear a tie like me? And I say, no, I can't. I have to wear my uniform. Um, but, uh, but I wore one today. Um, so my wife, Stephanie, our oldest, Eden, who's six, um, Benjamin, who's five, um, <laughs> Alethea is three, and then Zoe is one. So those are those are our children. Um, thank you. Um, so as as you mentioned, um, part of my my role as circuit visitor is I am tasked with visiting all the congregations within our circuit uh, within a three year period. Um, so last time I visited uh, was I think maybe how long have you been here? Uh, it'll be three years in September. All right, so it's about three years ago. Um, and so it's a new triennium, and so I, I've returned to do my duty as circuit visitor. Um, the circuit visitor is a position that kind of acts on behalf of both the congregations of the circuit as well as the district president. So our circuit is comprised of your congregation, of Our Savior in Burlington, of Good Shepherd in Pleasant Prairie, of Messiah in Kenosha, St. Paul's in Union Grove, um, our church, St. Peter's in Waterford, and then the Lutheran Chapel of the Cross in Mount Pleasant, uh, which is, you would think is in Racine Circuit, because it's in, right on the outskirts of Racine, but it's in the Kenosha Circuit. So um, we have seven congregations that make up our circuit. Circuits are comprised of anywhere between seven and 14 congregations. Um, so we have seven. 
Uh, Racine also has seven. Um, we do most things together as Racine and Kenosha Circuits. We, we meet together for our, our monthly pastor studies, where we study both the Word of God and the, the Lutheran confessions together. We worship together, we commune together. Um, right now is Synod Convention, as we, as we had prayed for during worship today. Um, so all of the heads are down in, in Florida, um, sitting through one really big, long meeting. <laughs> so if that sounds enjoyable to you, uh, talk to him. Um, um, so I, I wanted to be here, too, to also ask if you have any questions about the district, about our circuit, um, about synod, um, because that's one of my jobs um, to, to come alongside and uh, see if you have any of those sorts of questions. So do you have any questions for me? Yes. My name is Doug Bird. I am a visitor here. We are uh, members of the church out in southern Arizona in the English district. Okay. Can you give me a short explanation of why there is an English district? Yeah. I can tell you why there is one. I can also tell you why we don't really need one anymore. I agree with that. <laughs> Unless you're sending this to Bishop Hardy, then I, I take what I said out. Um, so the English district was started because the Missouri Synod spoke German. Okay? Uh, we were a synod of German-speaking people for the majority. There were some Norwegians, things like that. Um, and there was an English synod. So that was English-speaking people in the United States who had the same confession as we in the Missouri Synod did. And so it was decided, well, you believe the same thing, we believe the same thing, we want to continue speaking German, we want to continue speaking English, and so the English Synod merged into the Missouri Synod, and they were able to retain their congregations and speaking in English. Um, so that's why there is one. Obviously, according to our conversation right now, um, there, there isn't as much of a need for an English Synod anymore. There are two non-geographical districts within our synod. So we are in the South Wisconsin district, which makes sense, because we are in South Wisconsin, even though you guys are dangerously close. Yeah. Um, no offense to all you Illinois. Um, so there are two non-geographical. One is the English district, and the other is the Slovak district. So you can kind of guess why we have the English district. Well, the Slovak district was started because they were S Slovaks. Um, you know, we have slightly different uh, customs between uh, the Slovaks and between the Germans. Um, so they were allowed to retain their own government within the government. Um, and so you have, so like for us, for if you go to a South Wisconsin District Conference or Convention, it's in the South Wisconsin District. Well, in the English District or in the Slovak District, their congregations are throughout the country. So it's very hard for them to meet in specific places. Um, but that is why there's an English district. Um, how congregations are still forming in the English district today, I'm not totally sure of. Uh, it would make more sense for them to be more geographical like the rest of us. Our, our church was formed in 83, 1983. Yeah. And I don't know why they chose to be part of the English district. Um, they did, and so we are just an English district church now. Sure. Yeah, the English district is, is an interesting one. Um, for, for instance, Hales Corners, Lutheran Church, if you're familiar with Hales Corners, is in the English district. All right? Um, but that is not the only picture of the English district. Have any of you ever been to Fort Wayne, Indiana? Sure. Yeah. All right. Have you ever attended Redeemer in Fort Wayne, Indiana? Okay. Redeemer is also in the English district. Um, but they are very liturgical. Um, incense, prostrating, all those sorts of things. So the same district, um, completely different ways of, of worship. Um, so why, why congregations are still forming in the English district, I'm not totally sure. The other interesting thing about the English district is that they do refer to their district president as bishop, um, which is a, a scriptural term. Believe it or not, if you search the scriptures, you will not find the words district president anywhere in the scriptures, but you will find Episcopus, a bishop. Um, and so, but they do refer to that him as bishop. His, he is Bishop Jameson Hardy. Um, so, 
There's the kind of longer version of it, of why there is. Are they in talks about combining it all, or no? They have had those discussions in the past. I think one of the things that happens is that the English district, some congregations will find solace there. So um, all of our districts should be working in the same direction, and that is scriptures and confessions. That's what we are as Missouri Synod Lutherans, right? We are confessional. We are scriptural. We are... Um, following what God has commanded in the scriptures. And, uh, and so it would be profitable if everyone in synod were working on the same direction. The word synod means walking together. Um, and sometimes there's some discord, even between districts. And so at times, um, a district might be a little bit looser, and so congregations will occasionally go in that way, uh, and vice versa. So... It, the English district is very spread out, which makes it very difficult for, for, for Bishop Hardy to do his job as a bishop, because he's trying to go everywhere. Um, so the district presidents operate on behalf of synod president. The synod president was technically originally charged to visit every congregation in the synod. Okay? Now, when everything was around Missouri, in, around the St. Louis area, that was much easier. As Synod expanded and merged, right, so the Missouri Synod is a merger of the Ohio Synod, which is why, anybody know what our original name is? Well, other than the pastors. <laughs> the Deutsche Evangelisch Lutheran Synoda for Missouri, Ohio, und anderen Stadt. <laughs> so the German Evangelical Lutheran Synod of Missouri, Ohio, and other states. Um, <laughs> And so that, that's, it, it's a conglomeration, mergers happen, uh, we are now where we're at. Um, so the district presidents then were formed, it was broken down into districts, district presidents were tasked with visiting all their congregations. As districts grew, we have 26 circuits within our district, so that they started circuit visitors, which then act on behalf to make sure that the visits are, are done, which is why I'm here with you today. So, thank you. Yeah. It's got to be hard if you're a sole pastor of a church and a circuit visitor. How do you how do you get out to, to the other? I know you're fortunate enough to be in a church where you're the associate pastor. Yes. Yeah. So I, I have I have another pastor with me. He's been there for for 36 years. Wow. Um, and uh, and so that makes my my job as circuit visitor much easier um, because I can make visits. Um, but what I usually try to do so I'm on vacation. So unfortunately, I make working vacations, and um, and I try to get these done um, because not everybody has a Saturday evening service, which would make it easier for me to attend. Um, and that's okay. Uh, it, it's definitely okay not to have a Saturday evening service um, because uh, your pastor uh, doesn't get a weekend at all uh, with the Saturday <laughs> evening service. So, um, but I do have the luxury of having another pastor there. Um, which, which helps a lot. So do you have at other churches to allow those pastors to go visit? Um, well, the, other cir the circuit visitor for Received Circuit, he is the second pastor there. Oh, okay. Um, but I think what they try to do is, is if they have a week service, if they have a Thursday or a Wednesday or a Saturday, they try to go to those. Um, otherwise, like what I'm doing, I go on vacation and, and go for a visit. So. Just a comment, Pastor. We know you received such a large salary, you know, for doing this. <laughs> Thank you for all the extra time for our congregations here. You served us very well in the past. And uh, just thank you for all that. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, as he mentioned, it is a completely voluntary position. Yes. Uh, so, so uh, you know, because District President uh, Willie definitely splits his salary among all the circuit visitors. <laughs> uh, no, he has he has a job I would never want, and I'm very thankful that he does it, not me. Um, and, and I'm also thankful to have a faithful district president who operates in that office as well. But thank you. And, and thank you to Pastor Oswald for for being here and sharing God's message with you and, and setting, uh, you know, a table. I need a table for 26 
Only set up 13 spots. <laughs> All on one side, right? That, that's what you were discussing when I came down. <laughs> Only set them up on one side. That's right. The table for 26, all set on one side. Um, but uh, the Lord's Supper obviously is a very important part of who we are as Lutherans. Uh, we worship in word and sacrament, right? That is a true mark of the church. Um, and you have tasked this man right here to preach law and gospel and to administer Christ's sacraments rightly and orderly for your congregation. So we're very thankful to have him as well. Any, anything else? Pastor Conrad, what, what do you think will be the big uh, issues down in Florida at the convention? Nothing, because we're all grounded on the Word of God. <laughs> um, well, so, so, so as you might have known, uh, before last convention, they now vote for synod president prior to the convention, which was a big change, a thankful change, because now they can worry about other things at, at synod convention as opposed to simply focusing on synod president. They will have to vote on vice presidents. I think one of the biggest things is that first vice president Mueller has re retired from that position, and so they're going to be looking for a new first vice president of synod. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that shakes out. Um, and then there are six regions, which all have a vice president as well. Um, and so we'll see how that goes as well. Other than that, I don't think that there are any, I haven't heard at least of any big decisions that are being made at this convention. Um, in 2016, they took care of, of some big ticket items, um, uh, like, like the lay ministry program, which is an oxymoron in and of itself. Uh, but. So they, they took care of, of that. Um, former conventions have decided different things. And at the last convention, they said, look, we need to have ordained men giving the sacrament. Um, because that's, that's AC 14, Augsburg Confession Article 14, uh, which, which states that you have to have a rightly ordered call to preach, to teach, which is a part of the preaching office, and to administer the sacrament. And so at 2016 convention, they, they had that big discussion and, and uh, they decided that they would come more in line with making sure that the men who are doing it have received a rightly ordered call. So um, I don't think that there are any big ones this time around, unless you're aware of something that I don't, uh, which is good. It's, it would be nice to have a convention just go nicely and we can all rejoice together and uh, I, did any of you guys go to the 2016 convention? It was in Milwaukee, so you could, I mean, you're free to, to come and just witness it. Um, I went to help distribute communion at the opening service, which was, it was, well, that's, that's a, about online. okay, online. yeah, yeah, and you're able to do that again this time, so it's good to know what's going on. Um, sometimes politics can really bog things down within the church. Any of you on church council uh, would know how that goes. Um, but uh, we, we thank God that we have, we have faithful men in the ministerium and that we have faithful men and women in, in the laity that uh, help move us forward toward the end goal of Christ's return. Right? That's what we're hopeful for. Or we, we know it's going to happen, but that's what we're looking forward to when Christ returns. So... Well, you guys were, were great and easy on your questions. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate it, and my kids do as well. So, all right. Well, then I'll, I'll let you uh, continue studying God's word and uh, rejoice in the supper that Christ has given us. The fact that God has des designed it in such a way that he, he dwells with men, in such a way that he is the host, and he is the feast. Uh, that we rejoice that we have... Christ's body and true blood, as he states, hoc est, this is, um, therefore we believe it. It's, it's, it's hard when we're adults because we try to reason everything. Mm -hmm. You teach a child, this is also the body of Christ, and they say, okay, <laughs> well, why do we believe that? Because Jesus says it right here in his scriptures, right? So we, we side with Jesus. It doesn't make sense. I can't tell you why bread is also the flesh of, of our God. But Jesus says it. 
and so we believe. Yeah. All right, well, thank you. All right, that's a... So that surprised me, too. I didn't get a heads up he was coming. Nope. I didn't want you to be prepared at all. <laughs> a beautiful family. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anything else from uh, the account that we just read in, oh, I got to stop, because the question came up about the English district, so I got to always throw these stories in, I can't help it. <laughs> so my son-in-law, his father is a pastor in the English district, and his church is way up in the mountains in northern Arizona. So he likes to tell people he's the highest paid pastor in the English district. <laughs> uh, full disclosure, I was principal at Bethesda Lutheran School in Chicago for seven years. It was English district. Oh, see, there's yeah, there's some here in Wisconsin and several in Chicago. Yeah, that, that was that Seminex and all that stuff going oh. on at the time. So it was, it was exciting. That's interesting, Doug, yeah. After what? Would there ever be an option for them to to merge between the English district if, if Missouri were to stop speaking German? <laughs> we were also English district. Oh, you were? Wow. Went to Where? Schaumburg. Oh, for goodness sakes. All right. And they left city, so. <laughs> Okay. Well, so they're scattered all over the place. All right. Anything else from uh, from Mark 14? Anything that you noticed in this account here? The, it's the blood of the covenant. So what's what are other names or words for covenant? Promise. 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 Yeah. I'm thinking of one in particular, but that, that's probably the first one that would have come to my mind, too. Contract. 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 Yeah. Kind of an agreement. An agreement. It's almost like a contract. Yeah. There's another word in particular that I'm thinking of. Maybe this will trigger it for you. Um, the, Christ instituted a new covenant. Testament. Yeah, testament. Yeah, testament. So when, especially when you use the word testament, what do you think about? Gospel. Will. Yeah, your will. That's it. Your will, right? When you do your will, it's your last will and testament. So kind of the the, the, the final arrangements that you want upon your death. So this is what Jesus is instituting here. Um, are the final arrangements as he gets ready for his death. So you see his, his impending death here. Um, and then he says, I'm not going to drink it again until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So he's instituting it. When is it completed? When, like Pastor Conrad said, when Christ returns and this is all, this is all wrapped up. Okay, let's go to the, uh, the Corinthians passage. So 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I guess I'll start at verse 17. So uh, please follow, follow along with me. But in the following instructions I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you, in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat, for in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk, what? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? 
What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. All right, I think I'll stop right there for now. So what do you notice in this account now? What, uh, what stands out for you? Well, he changed the Passover into being the perfect sacrifice himself, right? Yes. Yes. I think I want to talk more about that. That when he in, in all these accounts when he says, Do this in remembrance of me, what is he saying to do in remembrance of him? Oh the this you were talking about. The this, yeah. Do this in remembrance of me. Well certainly this means the words of institution, right? The eating, the bread, the drinking of the cup. Yes. But I think, too, the, the context there is the Passover meal. And he's saying, from now on, when you do this Passover meal, do this now in remembrance of me. What was the Passover a remembrance of? Angel of death. The, yeah, the passing over of the angel of death and the deliverance of God's people in the book of Exodus. We're going to read that if we have time. We might not have time today. Um, <coughs> Now Jesus is saying, when you do this, now it's a remembrance of me. So he then becomes the Passover lamb. He becomes the one that we're remembering how with that sacrifice, the angel of death passes over us and we're saved, we're being delivered. And the blood it. of that lamb actually did protect those people. Exactly. 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 So to me, this is our fulfillment of the Passover when we take the Lord's Supper. Even the unworthy. Yeah. He just did what he said. Yeah. That's right. Don't, yeah. Must a minister consecrate the elements? Okay, so we're, we are going to address that question in a future class, but since you guys won't be here, <laughs> it's, a, it's an excellent, excellent question. How far in the future? Uh, sometime between now and October. I don't know. <laughs> we will not be here that long. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'm doing my study for this class, and the, the, the amount of information is vast, and I, there, there's so many. I, I just don't know how to parcel this up yet. I haven't decided how to structure everything. There, there's so much to cover, and a thousand questions. But that is one of the, and, and one of the good questions. Does a pastor have to do the words of institution? And the short answer is yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, Except. <laughs> well, th there, there are two parts to that. One is do you have to have the words of institution? And the answer is yes. So there's a document, I just was reading it yesterday as a matter of fact, from the um, Commission on Theology and Church Relations where they specify it's in all four of these accounts that we've read. Now the wording, the wording that I use up there when I do the words of institution, which of these four accounts does it come from? That's a trick question because it's kind of a conglomeration, right? It pulls from all. Um, but those words of institution appear in all four of those accounts. And so when Jesus is saying do this, clearly that is necessary. Can you just break some bread and say, here's the body of Christ, everybody eat up. If you don't have the words of institution, it's not the Lord's Supper. Remember, a sacrament is the visible elements and the word. And so without the word, it's not the Lord's Supper. So you have to do the words of institution. Does a pastor have to do the words of institution? And there again, the answer is yes. Pastor Conrad just referred to Augsburg Confession um, Article 14, where um, a rightly called 
minister is the one who is supposed to, to preach and conduct the sacraments. So Luther and, and the Luther and um, some of our theologians they they discuss this. Um, how about baptism? So who should do a baptism? The pastor. Should. But in an emergency, who can do the who can do a baptism? Amen. Any Christian. But the Lord's Supper, who should do the Lord's Supper? A pastor. pastor. But in an emergency, who can do the Lord's Supper? And the answer that the theologians give is, there is no emergency for the Lord's Supper. There's, you know, we, we should take it regularly and, and often, and we should look forward to it. But is there any time where you absolutely must have to take it? No. Uh, so I remember there was a, I might have mentioned this last week, there was a guy in my Sunday school class back in the church in Virginia, and he always used to raise his hand and he'd say, you know, if I'm out with my buddies on a camping trip and we want to celebrate the Lord's Supper out there, why can't I do it? What, what's, wrong, what's wrong with the priesthood of all believers? And, and the answer that the theologians give to that is, um, if you use the priesthood of all believers to undermine the doctrine of, of the call of the ministry, then you're, you're holding doctrines against each other. That we're really not supposed to do that. So you should not have Holy Communion unless there's a pastor there to do the words of institution. Now, Synod, I think, has made some exceptions for um, congregations that don't have ministers. So they've had what they call licensed I think I want to call them licensed lay deacons or something like that, where they receive special training and they're under the um, authority and responsibility of another pastor somewhere. And that way, like a church in the middle of Idaho that's 100 miles away from any other LCMS church and there's only, there's only 19 people that left in the church and they, they can't, they're not going to be able to call a pastor and they can't get a visiting pastor every week to come all the way out there. They can get one of these folks who then can conduct the sacrament so that they can partake. So you'd have to ask people in Synod how that works exactly. I think there's probably some dissension about that. That's one of those issues where people say, should we really be doing this? And the practically minded people are saying, we've got to do it. We have to, because we can't take care of our congregations. And the ideologically minded people are saying, no, we shouldn't be doing it. Only pastors should do it. So that's, that's kind of the, where the middle ground is. Does, does anybody have more? Do you, maybe you even, by asking the question, maybe you know more about this than I do. Does there, is there some more insight that somebody has? My only question would be a deathbed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we would say no. I think we would say even that when someone's dying, receiving the Lord's Supper is not necessary. necessary. Right. Now it's different for the Catholics, right? We talked last week about the Catholics because they have, they have the um, lay Eucharistic ministers, the Lems. And the, le the priest consecrates the elements and then the Lems take it out and distribute it all over. We used to have Lems in the military. Now I'm telling stories again. So, you know. <laughs> so um, we, we never had enough priests for all the Catholic personnel in the military. So we would get military members to volunteer to be uh, lay Eucharistic ministers. And they would go through the training, and then the priest would consecrate, and then they would take it out to the field, and they could give communion then to the Catholic members when they're out in a field environment. Well, what started happening was, they're coming out there with the, with the consecrated elements, and uh, they're living in a tent, and so they're like shoving it, it's like stuffed under the rucksack over here, and it's getting all dirty when they're marching, and then somebody spills it, or another lay Eucharistic minister doesn't know what to do with it, he's got too much left over, so he dumps it out. And so There were all these things going on that the Catholics were going, ah, that's the body and blood of Christ, ah. So they, they, they took away that program. It was prohibited for the military members to, ex, to practice being lay Eucharistic ministers. They wouldn't allow them to do it anymore. Um, you had to go someplace where there was a priest. But one of the big differences we'll see when we get to it um, with that is that when in the Catholic Church, when you consecrate the host, it's now sacred. They, 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 they put it in the little, what do they call it? The, yeah, 
the tabernacle, yeah. And they people will even worship it and things like that. In the Lutheran understanding, that's completely wrong. Um, it's, it, it's not that it carries with it the Lord's presence forever and ever. Um, it's intended to be the Lord's presence in that bread for the eating and drinking. So if you're not eating and drinking it, you, sh you shouldn't have it. So you, in, in the Lutheran church, when we have leftover bread, either we eat it or we save it for next week and we use it up. And you treat it with respect, you know, we're not, we're not stuffing it, you know, underneath the dirty laundry somewhere or something like this. Treat it with respect, but it's intended to be used by eating and drinking. Um, we don't worship it somehow. We don't treat it as though the Lord's presence is now this, this thing, that be, and then it becomes what? An, an idol, it becomes an idol, right? All right, so that was a long roundabout answer to a really good, important question, though. Um, well, in the same vein, I think I just remember Buzz Aldrin got communion at outer space either on the moon or in transit. Really? So the other thing would be, could this be done telecommunication? Oh! <laughs> oh. oh. That's a good All question. Right. <laughs> so that's a good... <laughs> That's a good question too, and um, I have to I have to dig it up somewhere in all of my notes. There's a, a another paper too from the CTCR where there was a, they held communion and it was done that way by video, and um, they asked the CTCR for an opinion on that. And the opinion came back that that's not proper. That's not the right way to do it. Um, that it should be present, should be should be present, um, and that reminds me. Since we're out of time, anyways, I'll just another story. But I read about this in, in the, I think it was in Christianity Today a few months ago. Um, a woman, she's got like one of those immune diseases where she can't be in contact with other people, so she became a Christian and joined this church, but she can't actually go to the church, and she wanted to be baptized. And she wanted all her friends and family to see the baptism, so but they can't actually come to her house or do it. She can't go out to their place or anything like that. So they did it with this, um, um, these, uh, what do you call them? Like the, the avatar things on the uh, virtual reality. Virtual reality, that's the word I'm trying to think of, yeah. So all her friends and family got these things, you know. <laughs> And the, the pastor is the, like this little figure that comes out and takes the woman and dunks her in the water. And, uh, no. 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 Oh, that's the prince of power of the air doing that kind of stuff? Uh, that could be. <laughs> the power of the air. Uh, no. But you start to see how complicated this stuff gets, right? And all the questions that come along with it. So that's why we want to be grounded in the basic principles of God's word on this, the truths that are being taught in scripture. And then some of these complex questions, we're just trying to do things decently and in order to line up and synchronize the best we can with what the scriptures uh, teach. So we'll consider a lot of those things, but we want to, we want to definitely get the, get the ground organized here. So we, we won't, we'll spend more time next week, I guess, in 1 Corinthians 11. Then what I want to do, too, is take a look at um, the story of the Passover so we can see the tie from the Passover to the Lord's Supper, at least what I think is a strong tie there. And then we'll take, save your papers, because you see those four little boxes there? All right, so if I ask you to explain what all the views of the Lord's Supper are in Christendom, could you, could you do that? Well, after next week you will. You'll have it. Um, and that's real, it's really important. It's a very big deal. So you want to be able to, to have that understood. Okay? All right, let's, uh, let's close with prayer together. How we bless and thank you, O Lord, that you have given us your word, that you have given us this precious gift by which you bestow upon us grace and forgiveness of sins. Help us as we take a look at it. Help us as we wrestle and struggle with things that are beyond uh, the ability of our minds to understand, to trust, and to believe. 
and to comprehend where we are able. We ask, Lord, that you watch over all the brothers and sisters this week, wherever they would go, that you would guide and direct them. We ask, Lord, that you would put your blessing over us for the sake of Christ and for his kingdom, the one in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right.